Lesson 8 in My Father's House, uh, Christian Character. So let's have a look tonight together a, l a little bit about uh, the things that, uh, that sort of f present to us when we start to think about Christian character. Obviously, it's a well debated topic and many people offer all kind of opinions as to what is correct Christian character. But the question we ask ourselves is, how can I know? How can I personally know? What are the distinguishing uh, factors and marks in, the, in, in Christians? What, what you know, uh, makes us uh, stand apart? And how, in fact, can I know uh, that uh, there, what are the evidences of, of true believers, those that are true believers as against those who just profess a Christianity without uh, being believers? And we can apply this to ourselves. In fact, what unique marks could be seen in me as a true Christian? And what are the evidences that if somebody were looking, they could find in me? If I was, in, in fact, put before, if you were put before a court and the, and the topic here was, can we find you guilty of being a true Christian? Would they find sufficient evidence to convict you? That's a fair approach, isn't it? And uh, in fact, we did a play once as young people on that, very, on that very topic to see whether we could convict someone of being a true Christian. Uh, try it. Uh, is the evidence sufficient or is there reasonable doubt? And I think it's a very valid question. How can we really know, have confidence that we are true believers? And I guess ultimately we have to answer that it is by not uh, reputation, but it is really by character. There is a difference, isn't it? People can know some things about you. They can know you through your reputation. But it's really who you really are, who we really are in Christ that makes uh, the difference. Well, if you were to answer this question, how can we know uh, in a scriptural sense, what would be your response? How do you know a true believer? Brother Mike. By their fruit. Thank you, Brother Mark. That's exactly how we know. By the fruit. Jesus made that plaintively clear that it is the fruit that demonstrates uh, whether we are true Christians or not. In fact, here is the verse of Scripture in question. It's found in Matthew uh, chapter 7 and verses 16 to 20. He said, this, these are the words of Jesus. He said, you shall know them by their fruits. Do man gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? It's a fair question, isn't it? If you want an apple, you don't go to a thorn bush. You go to an apple tree. You know that you're likely to find that kind of fruit on that kind of tree. So every good tree, he says, bringeth forth good fruit. I want you to say that. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. This is a principle that God laid out. And then it says, and, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Okay, a good tree cannot, cannot it says, he said, bring forth evil fruit, and neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. In other, th in other words, the two things just don't mix. You're going to get the right kind of fruit from the right kind of tree. And then he said, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, is cut down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, Jesus insisted, by their fruit, or their fruits, you shall know them. I think it's quite uh, unmistakable that the outward manifestation of a person's life is really all too often a representation of the inner condition of that individual. And I think that we can see how at times people may learn to manipulate what they show on the outside. Uh, individuals can actually learn to present, shall we say, a better face or a facade, a, a, a veneer that a appears to be right, appears to be correct. And so this person may pretend and for a while may even get away with it, but sooner or later their speech or their actions or something about them betrays what is inside. And I think this is, again, a biblical principle. The scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so in a moment when they're not, whether an indivi this individual doesn't think he's being watched, or in a moment where he, he doesn't think someone is listening, they're likely to say or do something that betrays the facade, the, the, you know, the, what you see on the outside. Christians ought to, ought to be, uh, really with that terminology, that you know, what you see is what you get. In other words, what you see here should be exactly what's inside, what you get if you dig deeper. And I think that's a good rule of thumb to judge ourselves personally. Remember, would there be sufficient evidence to convict you, to convict me as a true Christian in a court of law? Or would there be 
reasonable doubt, reasonable enough to acquit you of not being a true Christian. That would be a terrible predicament. The truth is that we ought to be able to say guilty as charged when it comes to being true Christians. In other words, what you're seeing as a uh, presentation, as a reputation, as a character is what you will get if you dig deeper into that individual's life, into their habits, into where they go, what they listen to, what they watch, what they subscribe to, their ideas, their thoughts, their belief system, what they do when they're not being watched. This is the whole idea, is that dig as deep as you want, and what you see is what you get. That's a true believer. That's what Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. And he said, you're not going to find grapes on thorn bushes. A tree can be known by its fruit, and so that we and others can know that by uh, looking at the fruit, they can see the relationship or the quality of the relationship that we hold with God. You will notice as we... Uh, study this lesson tonight that both words and deeds are incredibly relevant as an outward sign of revealing our inward character so remember not just words we can say a whole bunch of right things but what do our deeds do what do they say and somebody uh, had the uh, you know the presence of mind and the correct character to say well you know it's words as sort of the 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 deeds or the actions that speak louder than our words so very true isn't it much can be said uh, with our tongues, but it's what we do ultimately that qualifies. However, both the words and the deeds are important when we are to display good fruit according to, uh, to the Lord. So let's uh, dive into this concept. How can we know? And if it is by the fruit, then it is the fruit that we need to understand is important tonight. So it seems it's all to do with being the right tree and bringing forth the right fruit. Well, as we study the scriptures, we note that there are really two kinds of trees, if you please. One tree that can be represented as the corrupt tree, the tree that Jesus spoke of as, as yielding uh, corrupt fruit. This is the evil tree or the tree of our past nature. The Bible calls it the old man. Uh, not as the terminology has been adopted in modern times, but meaning the man that was before Christ, the old man. That's the fleshly nature. It's the corrupt tree that cannot, according to Jesus, read those verses again, it says it cannot bring forth good fruit. So what happens and how can we explain when people who are not regenerated, who are not in Christ, who are not of a new nature, spiritual, how is it that they can appear to have some good things in their lives? It's possible that some fruit that we see on there appears to be correct, appears to be right. But it is not the kind of spiritual fruit that qualifies that person to be a son of God or a child of God or a person that's in Christ. So please be very, very careful that you judge the right way, the, Jesus, the way that Jesus judges. The other type of tree, of course, is what we might call the new tree or the good tree. In this case, the spiritual uh, man, the spiritual tree. It's, it's the one that comes out or becomes a, a, a tree from our being our spiritual nature. So our old nature, our fleshly nature is our old tree that we all have uh, had a part of. And unfortunately, the fruit of that tree is wicked, it's evil, it's not good, it cannot bring forth continuous and, and, and good fruit. And even if there appears to be something good here, there's something very rotten on the other end. But the spiritual man is capable, if he's in fact a new man and remains that way, the spiritual nature is capable of bringing forth good fruit. And here's the difference. Here's where we find, unfortunately, a, an overlapping here. And, and why we can sometimes see people who we know were born again, spiritually, bring forth rotten fruit. Have you seen that, unfortunately? And where we can see that there is some people who are not regenerate, they don't know God, but they seem to be loving. They seem to have sometimes more care than what do some believers. How is this? Well, there is a slight overlap that I want to explain to you here tonight. You see, the whole idea is that as Christians, we are directed to do some putting off and some putting on. According to Scripture, it is up to you and I to put off. Say put off tonight. Put off. That's an important word. Put off the old nature. In other words, we've got to disvest ourselves of the old nature, the nature of sin, the nature that was before we knew Christ. 
we have to put it off like a, an old jacket, like a, a tattered garment. We have to take it off. And then it says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. So put off the old man, which is corrupt. Now notice what it is, which is what? Corrupt. corrupt. The old man is corrupt. The inner portions, the, the workings of the old man is fleshly. And ultimately the fruit is going to be corrupt. A corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed, it says, in the spirit of your mind, and that ye say, put on now. Now see, this putting on is literally a becoming dressed with the righteousness of Christ through the spirit of God and put on the new man, which the Bible says is after God is created how? In righteousness and holiness. So let's get the distinction very, very clear. The old man is corrupt, okay, and is has deceitful lust, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. and It's all part of the old nature. But the new man has been created in righteousness and holiness. So when we are in the Spirit, when we make sure that we put on, and by putting on it means staying in Christ, making sure that we live in the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, we are walking in righteousness and true holiness. But what happens when we quit praying or we don't, give place to the Spirit of God? What happens if even whilst we are Holy Ghost filled and walking with God, we start to do a bit of putting off of the new man and putting off some of the old? Does that still work? Well, sadly, unfortunately, it does. And that's why we see many times when new creatures, people who should be walking in righteousness and true holiness, are doing all the wrong things or doing some wrong things, still participating in the old man and the old tree, the old nature. And guess what happens? The fruit of the new man becomes corrupted. Very quickly, this beautiful apple that was once so crunchy and juicy and lovely to eat in has now got worms. And it's starting to deteriorate. And it starts to decay right there on the tree. And it's plain for most people to see that are looking and saying, ooh, that used to be a great tree, but look at that now. It doesn't mean that this person at this point has already fallen from grace, but if they continue that way, chances are, what did Jesus say? If a tree does not bring forth good fruit, what happens to it? It is hewn. There comes a time when the relationship with God ceases, and the goodness of God is not going to flow through that person any longer because God will not be a participant in bringing forth bad fruit. Can you see the responsibility? God gives us a new nature when we come to Christ for the very good reason that we are to bring forth good, tr good fruit. Now, here's another scripture that confirms what we've talked about in Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. Um, the Bible says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have what? Put off the old man with his deeds. So it's not just the actual concept, but the very actions of the old man, the thinking of the old man, what the old man did and is capable of. And then that you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Once again, the same direction in Scripture, uh, twice at least, but other times too, where we are told to put off the old nature, reject it, take it away from us, and to put on the new nature in Christ. Now, this is a day-to-day -day responsibility that each of you and I have, each of us have. And without doing that, we are likely to find ourselves naturally leaning towards our carnal nature. So here, here's the point. Do nothing, and soon enough you'll find yourself leaning back towards the old nature. To do something that is good, you've got to keep on putting on the new man, and putting off the old nature, saying no to the flesh. So remember these two actions, please. Very important. Put off the old nature. Put off the actions of the old man, the thoughts of the old flesh, the things that used to be, the things that you know the old flesh is capable of, and put on the new man. The new man that is created in righteousness and true holiness, that is created after the image of Christ who has made us. So... This issue of character is incredibly important. And in case you, you're wondering, is it, is it easy to spot? Can it be seen? Well, yes, the evidence of a good character is very plain. It's almost as plain as the noses on our faces. It's not something we hide too easily. If you've got a big nose like mine, you can't put it anywhere. It's got to be there, and you see it. And it's just like that, as it were. Character can be seen because it can be heard and can be observed. 
Okay, so it's very important that we make sure we put on the new man. Not just as a facade or a veneer. Remember, not just in words, but in deeds also. So let's have a look at these concepts as we move through our uh, lesson. Because you see very clearly there are two trees, two types of trees as we are studying it uh, tonight. Uh, we see the old tree. It is a bad tree. Uh, it is a bad tree with the old nature. In fact, the scripture describes the kind of nature that it is. It says now the works of the flesh, which is the old tree, are manifest. What does manifest mean? Visible, noticeable. They're open for everyone to see. They're open. And you can see these everywhere. And, and they are adultery and fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. Now this goes on, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not, and this is quite categorical, inherit the kingdom of God. Can you see the problem with the bad fruit? Isn't that it's just, ah, well, it's bad fruit, you won't eat it. Oh, no, it has a reward attached to it, and that is eternal damnation. So please notice that the bad tree, the tree that you were saved from, uh, the tree that your old nature is capable of being, it brings forth only corrupt things, evil things. If you're saved from sin and you grew up in, in that lifestyle, you only have to cast your eye back just for a moment and a glance to the past will remind you that's, that that's exactly where Jesus brought you from. Now, it's, it's wrong for us to be in Christ and return to any of that, clearly, because we are returning to our dying and to our uh, damnation. Uh, clearly, the, the uh, evidence of, of these things is seen all around us, and uh, we know from, uh, from observation that the outgrowths of this kind of life of the un unregenerated person, if we're not gen regenerated in Christ, uh, are all sorts of perversions, sexual perversions and pride and laziness and unforgiveness, lack of forgiveness, bitterness, revenge, gossip. And by the way, some of these things can reappear as shoots, you know, back in our new life if we're not careful. Gossip, slander, selfishness, mocking, lying, greed, cheating, complaining. You, you may think, oh, you know, it's only complaining. Everybody complains. But do you know that that has its roots back in one of these aspects of the tree and the fruit of it? And whenever you find any of these outgrowths, you know, on the back hill at our home, uh, th there were several trees that were growing uh, sort of on a very steep hill and because of it th they were likely to fall in our house so we, I cut them down. One of them in particular I was told uh, was actually considered a weed um, and uh, it's not you know, supposed to be removed anyway. So, so we cut it down. But what I noticed was in spite of my cutting them right down close to the ground uh, that what with time uh, they started shooting up again and here's a shoot you know and you've got to break it off and then there's another shoot. And of late, I haven't been there for a while, and one of those shoots has grown to the thickness of a young tree already. Now, if I left it there, the tree that I had cut down would be totally replaced by a brand new tree from a tiny little shoot that came out from the side of it. I had cut it close to the ground, but there it is today, thriving and still growing and still being a noxious weed. My point is exactly that that's what happens in our, in our spiritual walk if we're not careful. We may be regenerated. We may have cut down the old tree and removed it to that degree. But sometimes there can be outgrowths, which if we allow little shoots here and there, if we allow them before we know it, some laziness, some aspect of lying, some aspect of greed, some, some gossip or some pride or laziness can creep back in. And you leave it there long enough and it will grow. And it will grow. And before you know it, you're back into uncleanliness and fornication and idolatry and witchcraft. How did you ever get there from being saved? We allowed the old nature to creep back in. Very, very important that we are alert and alarmed whenever we see any of these new shoots uh, come out. Break them off. Remove them. Remember what the scripture says? Put off the old man. Crack it off, break it off, cut it off, burn it, you poison it, do what you have to do to the old man, but get rid of it because it will come out into your new, new nature. Okay, in the same manner that there is a bad tree, Jesus said, there is a good tree. A good tree that can be seen and can be readily noticed because of the fruit. 
Fruit is plenteous. It's, it's good to look at. It's good to eat. It's, it's a type of fruit that you want to be able to see and notice. And again, there is an outgrowth uh, from this, of course. The outgrowth of this life that is transformed by Christ will reveal honesty and self-control and control of temper, trustworthiness. You know, a person that's changed in Christ is a person that works hard, is generous, who is clean of his speech, not a foul mouth like he used to be. Remember, that was a sign of the old ma- p- person. The new person is a clean tongue. He has edifying speech. He's not out to gossip and pull down and, 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 and destroy another person. He's out to edify, to build up and to be strengthening. Uh, he's, he's known for his kindness, his forgiveness, for love and for sexual purity. Brethren, these are obvious signs that are, can be quite easily read in most of our lives within a few moments, really, of being with each other. And so this is why I'm saying that if there is a veneer to try and show uh, you know, a, an image of what we are not, it's, it's soon discovered because our deeds will show our actions. And that's why we need to concentrate on this concept. It is quite uh, scriptural. Uh, Notice that there is no substitute, by the way, for the things that Jesus does. The world doesn't have them. They certainly don't last. And and I think they can be easily seen in these two ways, as we've mentioned. The good words and good works. In fact, Scripture is very clear on this, uh, that the Lord will establish us through these very uh, two uh, two, uh, fields or two areas that define our character. So here we go. The words and works somebody said well what about our minds well chances are uh, that if what you're speaking uh, comes from the heart and what you're doing which is your actions are good then it's got to come through a pure mind as well you see it's the outflow of what is inside so what comes outside is usually an outflow of what's inside okay so uh, jesus uh, said it this way i guess i'll read you uh, the scripture that uh, is in question here in Second Th- Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse 16 and 17, this is the Apostle Paul writing, but he said this, Now our Lord Jesus himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every what? Good word and good work. Okay, every good word and work. Remember the words of Jesus uh, that you cannot, uh, uh, you know, gain good fruit from a bad tree. So good words and good works are two of the major evidences that show us character. Now, some people, as I've mentioned earlier, are capable through their words to produce or cast or show an image that they're all okay. But soon enough, somewhere on the line, it will be revealed through the works, through what people do. So, brethren, remember, we've got to be genuine. What you see is what you get type of Christians. All right, so let's talk about good words first up. If you care to turn to James and the third chapter, you will find uh, amazing instruction on the tongue and and what the tongue is all about. If Just turn quickly there with me, and I'll point some of the verses out to you. But the whole chapter really speaks about the importance of the tongue and um, in words, essentially. And um, <coughs> James made a, an amazing, uh, uh, you know, uh, or laid out an amazing chapter here when he spoke about this topic. And I would suggest that uh, we won't be able to do it here tonight, but I would ask you to uh, go home and read and study this chapter because he says very clearly that if a man uh, can control his, um, his tongue, then he's, he's a perfect man. And so obviously this little member in our mouths uh, is the one that causes most of our troubles. Mm? And you think about it, if you will, much of your trouble, whenever it's taken place, it started because of something that was said. Isn't it true? And that's how it works. So he talks about, um, uh, for instance, the fact that the tongue, uh, no man can, uh, can actually uh, control. It seems that it's something that no individual can control by themselves. We need the Holy Spirit to help us bite our tongues, <laughs> literally, and hold them back. It says that just like, uh, you know, uh, for instance, man is able to turn a whole ship with the little rudder, you know, uh, and they can do all kinds of things that way. But then it says uh, the tongue, even though it's a little member, it boasts great things and it can 
light up amazingly big fires. Uh, a tongue is a bit like a match. You don't need a big lot of fire to start off with, but it can ignite an awful lot of, of kinder. And so, uh, uh, so I, I guess I, I would say that uh, we need to be careful what we ignite, what tinder we enlight, uh, ignite with our tongues uh, when we speak. Be extremely careful with that. And then it says, it, it teaches that um, uh, man has actually uh, tamed all kinds of beasts and birds and serpents and animals of the sea and so forth. And yet, it says, no man can tame that tongue. It's an unruly member. And he goes on to, to teach so much about uh, also trees. He says, can fig trees uh, be... Um, uh, bear olive berries or can uh, vine uh, bear figs. He explains that every kind of fruit comes from the right kind of tree. Once again, just like Jesus said, uh, there are some good trees and some bad trees. And you can't expect um, a, a bad tree to bring forth good things. But once we are in Christ, we are a new person, then good words should come naturally. It should be something that is the outflow of the Spirit in us, and the same with good works. So please do read the, uh, the third chapter of the book of James, and you'll find that um, he teaches a great deal on the subject, and it is a very good chapter to remember. Uh, another a portion of scripture is found in Titus chapter 3 and verse uh, 2, and here it says that we should speak no evil about any man, and, uh, and I think it's an important concept to remember. Now, I know that uh, we are to tell the truth and there are some times when you may be called on to have to tell uh, the facts or the truth about something you've seen or heard or what have you, which may not be exactly what that person may want to hear. Uh, that doesn't mean you, you, you don't tell the truth, but what it does say is that we should not be setting our task to pull down someone else or to, to enjoy just having a go or a dig at someone else, speaking evil of. In fact, that word evil there, to speak evil of, it comes from a Greek word that actually means to blaspheme, interestingly. And to blaspheme is to calumniate, to call down, to without reason, to have, uh, well, I guess to speak negatively of. Uh, it makes me think of gossiping or speaking behind someone's back. Basically to do injury to that third party that is not there and cannot defend themselves. So please be careful of that practice. Unfortunately, being human means we can at times uh, unwittingly participate in conversations or listen to people do this. And if we don't take a stand, then we are participants in it and we're really just as guilty of saying, hey, whoa, whoa, I don't want to hear this. You're talking about someone that's not here. It's negative. If you want to say that, you go and talk to that person about it. Okay? And that's very, very important. If, in fact, they're speaking about ministry or uh, uh, brethren in the church, even more so, it is our responsibility to take a very, very firm stand. Okay? So remember this. The good words are a sign of the good fruit of the new nature that is found in Christ within us. And... If, a, if you're a good tree, then that's what we will be seeing. That's what will be noticeable. Okay, there is another portion of Scripture here in Colossians 4 and 6 that says, Let your speech always be what? With grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. I think, in other words, it's speaking about the kindness that is in our speech or the right balancing. There's a righteousness in it. What does seasoned with salt mean, do you think? What is it talking about that our speech should be seasoned with salt? Hmm? Yeah. Jay. Tasteful. Yeah. In other words, not never out of taste. Have you ever been in company of, and somebody makes a comment and it's just way out there and it's just everybody freezes and it all goes crack? That's it's hardly tasteful. Or you know, and then on top of that, it's it really it's pointing to the fact that what things we do say should be meaningful. And meaningful in a positive manner, edifying in other words, to build up character and to encourage, never to pull down. So, you know, seasoned with salt. I think Jesus said that you are the salt uh, of this earth. If, if, the, if, if the salt loses its savor, of what use is it? And that's where you hear so much talk and ramble about a whole bunch of stuff that means nothing, means little. It has no value and it's just noise. That should not be the way of Christians, just talking for talking's sake. In fact, look, say nothing, say little, if it's not going to be salty in the sense of tasty, tasteful. 
Okay, and be careful uh, that those things that you do say uh, are meaningful unto the Lord. So good words. Now there's a lot we could say on this topic of the tongue and how that it brings life or death, depending on what you choose. Uh, and so we all have this, this responsibility to control our tongues, to make sure that what things are stated uh, are favorable and that are in, you know, glorifying to God. If, um, if God would be ashamed of the things we say, then we should not say them. It's that simple. And uh, so make sure that they don't speak evil of anyone, that it's uh, kind and with grace, seasoned with salt. Remember, the good words have a lot to do with the kind of fruit that we're bringing forth. But then there's good works. And of course, our actions speak louder than words. So it's so important that the works are there and are showing the right, uh, uh, the right fruit also. So this is a faithful saying, Titus 3 and 8. And these things... I will that thou affirm constantly. So you say them and you affirm them. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain what? Good works. Okay, these are the things good and uh, things are good and profitable unto men. So he says, I want you to affirm constantly as he speaks to Titus. He says, I want you to affirm all the time that those that are in God, that have believed in God, the Christians, the, the, the regenerated people, you and I, the family of God, should be careful careful to maintain good works now why do we have to be careful i mean surely it's what we do right well here's the problem as you've seen a moment ago uh, sadly even though we are in this new nature of the spirit even though we are very much filled with the spirit believers it's so easy to slip back into our old nature and if we're not careful instead of doing good works we can easily slip into doing the works of the flesh once again. Saying and doing the things that God saved us from. And that does not bring God glory. It brings a great deal of shame. People look on and, and start to say, hang on, that is not a work that belongs to a Christian. You could tolerate in someone who doesn't profess Christianity, but in a Christian, that doesn't add. And so you've got to be so careful to maintain. Not only the witness can be spoiled, but obviously a great deal more of your relationship with God will, uh, will deteriorate if you don't do good words, good works. And this is a choice that we have to make every day. Here's another beautiful portion of Scripture in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 and 10. It says, And let us not be weary in well-doing. Come on, it's tough sometimes to do right, isn't it? Sometimes it's so much easier, it would be so much easier, just to sort of let it slip, let it just go by the wayside and, and just ignore this instance. But the scripture encourages believers not to be weary, not to get tired of doing good, well doing, okay, and doing well. For in due season, it says, we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do what? Good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Let me, let me stop to comment here a moment because this is an important concept. Okay? I want you to see what it's doing. It's saying for us to make sure that we don't quit on doing the right thing. We don't stop or get tired of doing good works. Remember, it's part of the good fruit that we uh, bring forth unto the Lord. It says we will we'll reap it in due course if we do not faint. And as much as we have opportunity, this means in every chance that you get, every time that you have a chance, don't hesitate to do good. And here's the point. Sometimes people just think, oh, you know, I, I did my good deed for today. The rest I can do whatever I like. Be careful of that attitude. That's not a Christian attitude. In every opportunity that God presents in your way to do good, do it to the best of your ability. In fact, that is a righteousness that's relative to you at this time in your particular moment in time in life with God. So make sure you perform it. It says, and let us do good unto all men. But then it's, it sort of narrows the field for us. It says, especially. I want you to say that, especially. That's important. Especially unto them who are of the household of faith. These are the brethren in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be especially careful to do good towards now, here's two attitudes that I think God is displeased with. Sometimes we treat the family of God with such familiarity that we put them in second or third place, behind even other people, people in the world, or behind an unsaved family or what have you. 
The Bible tells us to do good to them especially. And another attitude that we take, unfortunately, which again is born out of familiarity, is that we take it for granted that we don't really have to try as hard with our brothers and sisters, simply because they are brothers and sisters. So where we think and are thoughtful of a person out there because, hey, we might win them to Christ, and that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. That's a good attitude. But we don't think with the same attitude or care or tenderness towards the brethren in Christ. The Bible says it should be especially so. So if we're going to do good, we start at home and we widen our field from there elsewhere as well. Can you understand what Scripture is saying here? This is part of bringing forth good fruit. When we don't bring forth the good fruit of God, it is evident it hangs on our tree and it can be seen and tasted by all who are present. So let's remember the good deeds along with the good works. Here's one more scripture in Colossians 1 and 10. It reads this way. It says that you might work, walk worthy uh, of the Lord unto all pleasing, being what? Fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There is no good work that we can't be fruitful in. Now, I'm not saying that you can do absolutely everything that is there to do, but in every good work that God presents to you as an opportunity to do good, whether it's to say a kind word or to lift a load with somebody or to just be present or to make a call, whatever it is, there is some good work, some aspect, something that you can do. And in every good work, it says, in everything that God presents to you, the opportunity to do, be faithful in that. Unto all pleasing. You know, God is pleased when we function the way we are supposed to. Remember, we were created as new creatures, right? In holiness and true right, uh, righteousness and true holiness. And it says, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So, I think we can see from Scripture that there are two trees, the old one that God saved us from and that God hewed down when he saved us and that we do not want to allow any new shoots to grow up. And then the new tree that God has planted, the spiritual man who is supposed to bring forth good fruit. And the good fruit is often seen in the words, the kind of words and the kind of deeds uh, that uh, we, uh, we perform. Let's analyze the good fruit a little bit closer now, if you will come with me to a very important portion of Scripture. And of course, it's found in Galatians and uh, the fifth uh, chapter where we read about the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, the fruit of the Spirit says is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such. There is no law. And that's found in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 22 and 23. Well, we have to define then what this good fruit is. And if we're going to define the good fruit, the Bible calls it the fruit of the Spirit. And in another portion of Scripture in Ephesians, the Bible says that oh, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So get this, when you are performing the right things according to the Word of God, that's righteousness, and you are reflecting the goodness of God, in good works, and good words, and you are living and walking in the truth that God has shown you, you are bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the Bible calls it the fruit of the Spirit for a very good reason. You can't bring it forth without the Spirit. This does not exist in a person that is not Holy Ghost filled. It just doesn't happen. There may be similarities, but this fruit can only come about when we are in the Spirit, when we are filled with the Spirit and we live and walk in the Spirit of God. In fact, let me stress once again that you may have had the experience of the Holy Spirit being filled with the Spirit and still not bring forth fruit the way the Spirit wants to because you're not living, walking, following in the Holy Ghost. So it is conditional. You can see that. It's not automatic. It's not something that happens without us being involved as a, po as a, as a part of it. But neither can we bring forth this by ourselves without the Holy Ghost. Okay, so... If we profess to have a spiritual life, then we should possess uh, this kind of uh, fruit in our, in our lives, in our walk with God. These virtues that characterize us, show us the character that we are um, as a child of uh, the King, as a people of God. So, let's have a look quickly at, these, uh, at this portion of this fruit. It has been said that as fruit, 
it is not fruits. In other words, it is one fruit, perhaps different aspects of the same fruit, or if you please, uh, fruit in the sense of a, a plural word, uh, meaning different kinds of fruit, but meaning one uh, all to, to be uh, present in every case. In whichever way you want to look at it, the fruit of the Spirit isn't something you can isolate and say, let's see, ooh, I like love, so I think I'll just be loving. And then you're not charitable, you're not faithful, you're not temperate. That's not how it works. The fruit of the Spirit is something that grows just like you see on that tree. In every aspect of the tree, it's, it's, there, is a, there is an evidence of it. Okay, so if you want to see a tree in your head with various types of fruits on it, that's acceptable. Or if you want to see the fruit of the Spirit as one fruit but different portions of it, different aspects of it, that's okay too. But whichever way you see it, remember the fruit has to be present and this is what we need to develop in every aspect. So it's true that we can look at ourselves and say, you know what, I wasn't very gentle with that brother or with that sister. That wasn't gentleness at all. I need to allow the Holy Ghost to work with me so that I'm a little more gentle with the way I deal with things. Or you might be able to say, well, I wasn't too temperate in that experience. Uh, you know, and, and to be able to allow this fruit to grow, you need to participate by yielding to the Spirit of God. God will bring forth the fruit in you if you will yield to the Spirit. Let's go through them quickly, uh, or at least uh, individually anyway. And uh, the fruit com comes, of course, from being a good tree, being in Christ and by the action and work of the Holy Spirit in us. The first um, aspect of that fruit is love. And the Bible, of course, tells us that God is love. So you would expect if God lives in us, that one of the first things we would see is love. Love in the sense of God's love coming from us. A love that we have never experienced before we knew Christ. A love that extends to our fellow man. A love that makes us do things that go well beyond what we would expect. Love is an intense desire to please God, first of all, and to be of benefit or do good to our fellow man. Now, we demonstrate love when we love God first and we love our fellow man as ourselves. In fact, they are the essence of the commandments of God when you think about it. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And then it says to love others as you do yourself. So love is at the core of our entire walk with God and true love always will involve some aspect of sacrifice. So I want you to see this, that love always exp expresses a personal sacrifice and it's always to do with giving. Now please, I mean I say that most people think money. Money is only a very small aspect of giving, giving of oneself, giving of my time, of my mind space, of my heart, of my effort. Giving, in that sense, is a sacrifice of giving myself. And we do it every day when you think about it in so many different ways. When you s exchange your eight hours a day, ten hours a day, whatever it is for money, you are giving of yourself. You're sacrificing to earn those dollars. That's how it works. You know, when you are doing anything uh, by way of, uh, say, for instance, exercise, you're expending energy and time and effort so that you can gain health and perhaps being healthier or st sturdier in whatever context. There is a sacrifice of giving of self, if you think about it, in many different ways. When we do this towards God and we expend ourselves, whether it is our time, mind, effort, money, uh, resources, whatever it is, in service unto God or in doing good to others, we are showing forth the love of God. There is always a self-sacrifice involved in true love. Here is something I want to pause momentarily to express. is that Some people think that if you tell the truth of God to someone who is in sin, who particularly has known to walk with God, and you say, sorry, this is not of God, what you're doing is not correct, that you're not being loving. Now, it's true that sometimes we can be harsh in the manner we express some things. So please be careful when you correct someone or you uh, address someone that is in sin. Be careful to show the love of God in the manner that you say it, but don't, <laughs> don't fudge the truth either because that's not the love of God. Remember, who are we pleasing first? We need to show God love. If we displease God to try and please this person, we haven't shown the love of God. We have adulterated the love of God. If we say, oh, it's okay, you can do what you like because I want to try and be loving toward you. And we are actually demonstrating a weakness towards the faith that we should have and love that we should have towards God. Then we have not really shown the love of God at all 
with wickedness. So remember, love, a very powerful, very powerful uh, quality and a very necessary, pivotal part of the fruit of the Spirit of God, part of our character. Here's another one that is uh, part of the fruit, joy. The Bible translates this as gladness. I like that word, gladness. To be glad. It's a deep down joy. It's not just a momentary happiness. It's a gladness. It's a condition of the heart. And that's why I think it's fruit of the Spirit. Happiness kind of comes and goes depending on what happens to your day. One minute you can be happy, the next minute not so happy uh, depending on what's happened to you. But gladness or joy as the Bible calls it is a deep down and can be everlasting. In fact, it's meant to be that way even through the darkest times we go through. We can still retain a degree of joy and gladness within at the knowledge that uh, that. Uh, we have God. Jo uh, uh, the Lord uh, uh, Jesus wants us our joy to be full, the Bible says. And I think it is an exhortation of, of the soul, the knowledge that you know you're right with God. So even though you're going through a, a dark valley or a time of, of a terrible experience, if you know that you are right in God, deep down in your soul, you can still have that exaltation. This may be going wrong. Things may be not right, but I'm right in God. And that's a joy, a deep down joy that nothing can remove. This is much more than happiness. It is blessedness. And I think it is uh, something that is reflected all too often in the countenance of those uh, that are the people of God. Uh, I know that it's not always uh, correct or, or appropriate to look around and a smile on our faces as if painted on. But I think we should be ready to smile or ready to be able to be happy in context. Can you see what I'm saying? So that joy should be a trait of character in our lives. In fact, if people think of us, would they think of us as mostly grumpy or genuinely and generally happy? I think it's a fair question, remember? Will they find sufficient evidence to convict us as true believers? Okay, so the joy of the Spirit, very important. Here's another beautiful gift that comes from that being that tree in God. It's peace. And this translates from the Greek as tranquility. Um, uh, peace is not the sort of peace that the world gives uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, s tries to sell today. Uh, as in, you know, the peace that comes from being blown out of your brain with drugs or alcohol. That's not peace at all that's a temporary momentum moment you know of of uh, disconnecting from reality we're talking about the tranquility of the spirit that's deep down in your soul that beautiful stability that remains at all times that's the fruit of god and the bible calls jesus the prince of peace and when jesus lives within us we l we live with the prince of tranquility within us he's the one that's able to calm the storms of our lives are there going to be storms? Well, yes, of course there are. Everyone experiences difficulties, storms, dark times, sadness, sorrows, grief. The fact is that Jesus is able to come and speak peace to the troubled heart. That's the difference. In the world, such peace doesn't exist. In fact, it's quickly lost. In the Lord, we have it and we can continually receive it. Remember, the, the world does not give the same kind of peace and Jesus says, I'll give you peace, not as the world gives peace, give I unto thee. So there's a difference, and the peace of God lasts and passes all understanding, the Bible says. It goes well beyond human understanding. Here's another beautiful aspect of the, of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. It's long-suffering. Again, the Greek uh, describes this as patience. Patience, long patience, a patience that lasts and when we consider God's mercy and His patience in dealing with us, um, it, uh, it, you know, it certainly makes us think twice about, or should make us think twice, about losing our patience too quickly with our uh, brother or sister. And yet, we do, don't we? We, we should be a little more uh, durable when it comes to the provocations of others, uh, but we can be easily provoked, and that's where we lose our patience. But imagine if God lost His patience that way with us. So when you put it in that context, when you start putting in that perspective, you start to see that the fruit of the Spirit, good fruit that comes from a good tree, is that of patience. Please, I'm not suggesting that you won't find frustration sometimes. It's going to be there. But what you do with that frustration is all significant. You'll feel frustration, but are you going to give in to it and become impatient and short and cut and sharp? Or are you going to give in to the Spirit and become long-suffering? and patient in spite of the frustration. Will there be sufficient evidence 
to convict us as true believers. Here's another beautiful quality that we often uh, miss or don't consider too well, but it is part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's called gentleness. We live in a society that makes toughness and roughness and you know everything that's supposed to be strong. But did you know that gentleness is by far stronger than any of the worldly toughness you could possibly imagine? The Bible says a gentle answer or a soft answer turns away wrath. It's capable of doing things that anger cannot. Um, I believe gentleness is kindness and this unoffensive disposition will show itself just like the fruit on that tree. It will be evident because it's in dealing with people, a friendliness, a, a courtesy that makes us easy to approach, easy to talk to. And in turn, people want to spend time with you. They want to be around you because there is a certain kindness, a gentleness, a, a, a goodness about you that people really do look for. There's another fruit or another aspect of the fruit. It's called goodness. And I think it requires very little explanation. We have to do, say good words and, and, and do good works. So clearly goodness is necessary. The Bible renders this from the Greek word benevolence. And it is meaning a doing good to the souls of men. Doing good to the bodies and the souls of men, interestingly. So both at a physical and a spiritual level. Now, I wonder if we could think of different ways that we can share goodness to others. I think you can find every day we have this opportunity to do goodness and go out of our way to benefit someone else, whether by speaking kind words or by smiling, by being encouraging, or by uh, praying for that individual. The Bible says we should do good to all men. Remember, it says especially to those of the household of faith. Goodness, a very, very important thing that you can do every single day, somewhere along the line. <clears throat> Part of the fruit of the Spirit is faith, of course. And um, here we talk about faithfulness a great deal. It is to do with being loyal, honest, trustworthy. Uh, brethren, the, 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 the world is still looking for the manifestations, it says, of the children of God. And when they find someone trustworthy, honest, loyal, people take notice nowadays because there aren't too many people like that around. So it's very, very important uh, that we portray this quality and not just in one area, not just at work, but in all of our doings and dealings. Okay, so not just in one of the things that we do, but in all of our duties, uh, whether at home or at work, in all of our duties, in all of our responsibilities, let us be faithful. And again, the fruit of the Spirit, the Scripture says, is meekness. Can somebody describe this to me? What is meekness to you? Meekness. What do we mean by meekness? Yes. Humility. humility. It's an aspect of humility. Very good. Okay. Now, some people see meekness as being weakness because, again, it doesn't take the part of the stand, you know, stand uh, tough and, you know, big, uh, burly, you know, I'll smash you in the face if you look me the wrong way type of individual. Uh, meekness is actually quite the opposite. It's the portrayal that Jesus uh, gave us when he walked on earth. It does not mean spineless or cowardly or weak, but rather quite the opposite. It speaks more of mildness and a balance of temper. In fact, it's actually the ability to retain control maintain your temper that's what meekness is really all about in other words when you are being injured when you are being attacked when you are under suffering and under pressure for you to be able to hold on to that temper that's meekness that's the kind of humility of heart being able to kind of bear the uh, the load shall we say and the offense without retaliation in fact it is actually the opposite of anger and retaliation. So if you think of that, um, that's why we teach uh, children when they're growing up in our families. Now, you don't retaliate. If he's done the wrong thing, by you, you speak up, but you don't retaliate. Don't retaliate. How many times have you heard that, right? Why? Because it's an aspect of meekness not to just retaliate and do bad for bad. We often say two wrongs don't make a right. Very true. Okay. So it is important to recognize that it's a very powerful aspect of the, sp of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and that it is necessary uh, for us to show forth meekness. Okay, what about this uh, last one? That's the ninth uh, mentioned there in the, in the list. It's temperance. This one can be deemed as being self-control uh, in the sense that we allow ourselves to be moderated and governed by the Spirit of God. Please remember that it is the Spirit that brings forth the fruit. We allow that by yielding and participating in the process. So uh, <coughs> here it comes from the tree that is a new tree. 
through the Spirit of God. And uh, this it refers to control in, in all areas, especially in the scriptural context, those areas that are to do with sensual passions, natural appetites. So any sensual passion, natural appetites, things that we prefer, that our flesh wants, we need to make sure that we ex uh, experience and that we practice self-control or temperance according to scripture. It means curbing. It means sometimes saying no. It means saying no to negative emotions or overindulgence. You may see, uh, see it as, as um, excessive, but yes, it is, it is saying no to some foods that you eat or uh, eat excessively of, uh, or some activities you get into that control your time and your mind space. Particularly if you haven't read your Bible or if you haven't spent time with God, sometimes you have to use temperance and say no to that game or that TV show just because you like it, just because you always do it. What about God and what about your relationship there? So the fruit of the Spirit is this ability to curb natural appetites and saying no to them through the power of God. So what we've looked at tonight, saints, is, is the fact that character is readily seen in a Christian. And it is obviously read through words and deeds and that the fruit is what is judged by by way of judging character we see the fruit and that's how we can tell and uh, the fruit must be the fruit of the spirit in our next portion of the lesson Lord willing we'll have a look at how to cultivate how to have it and how to cultivate it and even how to develop and then inspect this fruit so that we can make sure it remains of a good quality will you stand with me tonight thank you for your attention and your time <coughs>